All right, peace and blessings, brothers and sisters, peace and blessings. Today, what we will be doing, we will be examining the book of Genesis chapter three, dealing with the fall of Adam and Eve. And particularly, we'll be dealing with the nuance of what was of that fruit of the tree of good and evil. Because it's many interpretations, it's many speculations, and it's many theories on what that what was actually on the fruit or the tree of good and evil. Was it an apple? Was it such and such? Or was it not apple? Was it an allegory interpretation? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna dive into the different type of theories that surrounds the mysticism of the tree of good and evil. Now, we know the ultimate reason of why the, the, the tree of good and evil was there. It was to give man and woman the free will choice to choose to either be to follow God or to follow their own desires. So what we're going to do in this lesson, we're just going to, like I said, we're going to tackle the nuance of the questions that one might have pertaining. What was the fruit? I'm going to give you the answer here shortly. But let's let's read a little intro into the different type of theories that goes into the story of the book of Adam and Eve. Check this out. It says the story of Adam and Eve found in the book of Genesis in the Bible has been interpreted and analyzed in various ways throughout history. Different religious traditions, scholars and thinkers have proposed diverse theories to explain the events and symbolism within the narrative. Now you got to see, you got to understand what theory is. So they said scholars, uh, thinkers, all propose their own theories. We're going to tackle that too in, in a second. Now just let me just run off a few of their theories. Because what is a theory, brothers and sisters? Let's read what a theory is. A theory is a well-substantiated and comprehensive explanation or framework that is based on observation, evidence, and reasoning. It is used to describe and understand a phenomenon, makes predictions, and guide further research. The term theory is commonly used in scientific context to represent an established and tested explanation of natural or social phenomena. But it can also be used more broadly to describe organized systems or ideals or concepts that help explain various aspects of the world. The strength of a theory lies in its ability to provide a coherent and logical framework that explains and predicts phenomena within a particular domain. So that's the that's the mindset of a theory. But the Bible tells us. Let's go to the Bible real quick before we die. No, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to get before myself. Let's read off some of these. Let's read off some of these theories concerning the tree of good and evil. One theory is a literal interpretation. Some religious groups adhere to a literal interpretation of the story, viewing Adam and Eve as historical figures. They believe that the fruit was a literal fruit and that eating it brought about the knowledge of good and evil. I like that one. That's the literal, that's the literal interpretation. Then you have allegorical interpretation. It says, others see the story as an allegory or a symbolic representation of human nature and the human experience. In this view, Adam and Eve represent humanity as a whole and the fruit symbolizes the acquisitions of moral consciousness. I like that theory as well because that theory goes hand in hand with the first literal interpretation, right? It says three, moral and spiritual lesson. Many theologians emphasize the moral and spiritual lessons conveyed by the story. They suggest that the fruit represents the choice to disobey God's command highlighting the consequences of human disobedience and the importance of free will. Now, see, all these theories are right in its own right. But see, the thing is, we're going to dive into the absolute truth because for people that want to have a nuanced question to say, well, what was on that tree? Because the, the objective and the moral was a spiritual lesson for man to understand that he has free will to choose good or evil. That's why... We, when we examine Genesis chapter 3, it would expound on that. 
And then you'll get to understand the terminology of when Christ in the Bible says that know that ye are gods. Knowing that you are a God or knowing that you are of God don't mean that you could fly in the sky and do all these, you know, with angelical, with celestial beings can do because we're still in the mortal state. But being as a God now identifies you knowing good and evil because once Adam was first created, all Adam knew was good. All he knew was good. But once he partook of that fruit of the tree of good and evil, he also knew evil. He became like the gods. Like that's what happened because the gods was created. The angels was created first and then they was created on the fourth day. Man was created on the what? The sixth day. Right. Let's go to uh, them before development of human consciousness. Some scholars view the fruit as a metaphor for the development of human consciousness and self-awareness. Eating the fruit represents a pivotal moment in human evolution where early humans gained a heightened awareness of their surroundings and their own existence. See, all that making good points. Number five, sexual knowledge and marriage. Another theory centers around the idea that the fruit symbolizes sexual knowledge or the awakening of sexual desires. This interpretation often links the story to the concept of marriage and the establishment of the mar marital relationship. I disagree with that because that's that what they say. A lot of people theorize that the, the fruit uh, was the woman's vagina. That can't be further from the truth. So these are different interpretations. And we're going to get into what God said using the Bible to break down what the interpretations is. Right. I'm just giving you all the theories Surrounding the mythicism of the tree of good and evil dealing with Adam and Eve. Number six, ancient Near Eastern mythology. The story of Adam and Eve has parallels with other ancient Near Eastern myths. Some scholars suggest that it shares similarities with Mesopotamian and Sumerian narratives, highlighting common themes of creation, human disobedience and the origin of humanity. OK, um, psychological and philosophical interpretations. It says certain psycho psycho life, um, psychologists and philosophers have examined the story from a psychological and philosophical perspectives. They explore concepts such as the human psyche, the nature of temptation and the ethical implications in the choices humans make. So these are all theories. Now, let's dive into the truth. And this is what I mean, like all these interpretations have a little right in it. The literal saying that it was an actual fruit. It could be right. The allegorical interpretation where it's saying that it's a symbolic allegory could be right. The moral and spiritual lesson of it all could be right. And the development of human consciousness could be right. All these theories could be right. And I, I use this analogy to show right is subjective. Truth is absolute, meaning this, you can have a math equation, four plus four, uh, get to the number eight, to get to the number eight, right? You could do four plus four is eight, seven plus one is eight, six plus two is eight. You have three different mathematical equations, all correct to get to the absolute truth, which was the number eight. And this is how you differentiate right, being right, which is subjective, into absolute truth. Now, we're going to dive into the story of Adam and Eve. We must go into the book that talks about Adam and Eve. So now let's dive into to get the actual truth. First, let's go into the Bible. Because when we just read the theories, you got six different theories of what seven different theories or interpretations of what they think the uh, Adam and Eve story symbolizes. Let's go into the Bible when it deals with interpretations. Let's go to First Peter's. Let's go to the book of. Uh, let's see, Second Peter's. We're going into the book of Second Peter's, chapter one, verse twenty, and it reads, "Knowing this first." That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, meaning understanding that it's the understanding of the scriptures. You can't have your own interpretation. It has to line up with the Bible is saying. Let me prove it to you. Let me show you. Let's let the Bible do the speaking. So 
because it should have no private interpretation. It shouldn't be like, well, I think it's saying allegorical or I think it's moral and spiritual. Let's see what it's actually saying. Right. Let's go to Proverbs three and five. Because no scriptures could be of any private interpretation. Right. That's why the Bible tells us this Proverbs chapter three, verse five. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Because a lot of people are interpreting how they feel they want to interpret the word of God opposed to what the word of God is actually saying. And that's when you get murky waters and you get theory and you get interpretations. You got to understand the Bible as the doctrine, as how it's written. <coughs> Let's go to, <clears throat> and I'm going to prove it. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. And it reads, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate for my mouth. It have commanded and his spirit. It have gathered them. See, so the Bible is saying you don't need to go into no other books to understand what the Bible is saying. You don't need to go into other theories or interpretations. Understand it from the lens of the Bible to understand this story. Right. So let's go to Timothy's first Timothy's and then we're going to get into the, the examination of the book of Genesis chapter three. Let's go to first Timothy's we're going to go to the book of first Timothy. Sorry about that. Pages are sticking. All right, let's see. I'm gonna stop finding, brothers and sisters, because science has their own ideologies and philosophies when it comes to this. There we go. Let's go. First Timothy, chapter six. Verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. So we got to listen. We got to understand the Bible from the context of the Bible and not from the, the uh, theologians aspect or these different interpretations. Using science, because that's what that's what science use theories. Theories is something that you have to do observe. You got to be observative and, and use research behind. It. And it still is a broad sense. So science, you can't really always go off science when it comes to the word of the most high God. And I'm explaining it because the Bible going to explain it. So now let's go to examination of the book of Genesis chapter three. Let's get to it. I just wanted to bring those scriptures out to kind of set the, the page on what we were just reading about these different interpretations. The Bible says we shouldn't lean towards our own understanding. The Bible says that we shouldn't, uh, no prophecy or any scripture should be of any private interpretation, meaning you can't lean towards your own understanding on what you think the scripture is saying. You can't mate it with science and other religious texts. You got to go into the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. And we can't trust oppositions of science because science is against God. Let's go. Now, this is the book of Genesis. It says, now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, have God said ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So now that's showing you that the literal interpretation was the absolute correct one, not the allegory or the, or the, the absolute was literal. 
that because God told him you can eat any fruit off any tree, but the one that's in the midst of the garden, don't go near it. Don't you touch it. Don't you eat of it. Because when you do, you're going to die. Now, people will say, why did God put that tree up? People will say, why God, if God is all knowing, all up in all these words, why would he put this tree in the midst of the garden to tempt man to fall? Let's get into the scripture real quick to prove God didn't put that there. And I'm going to go into showing you who put that tree up so you can get understand. It. But first, let me clarify that because some people are trying to blame God for this reason. Saying, well, if God knew, why would he allow this tree? Why would he do this? Let me show you. God didn't put that tree up. Let's go to the book of James. That's why he warned Adam, don't touch the tree. He told him the trees that he could touch. So let's go to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, or through 15. It says this, let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So that this, this annuls God putting that tree up. Because God won't tempt man to do evil. So when he was telling Adam, don't partake of that tree, it was a reason. And you're going to get the understanding in, in the reasoning why he told Adam that. And then Adam told his wife, but she didn't hearken to her husband. Check this out. It says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed like Eve was. When you read Genesis, the third chapter, which we were going to, she got enticed by that tree because it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and it was to make her wise. Then when lust have conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. So now that's showing you that God didn't put that tree in the midst of the garden. So now your mind might say, OK, who put the tree there then? Who put the tree there? We're going to get the answer. Let's read Genesis chapter three. So it says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the gardens, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. First lie. For God do know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He was telling the truth on that because that's what the fallen angels were. They were gods. These angels were gods. They was created in the fourth day. Man was created in the sixth day. Right? So it was a, a, a fight in heaven. And Satan and a bunch of his angels got kicked out of heaven to earth. And it was dark and void. So the most I was like, I'm going to build my creation down there. And they're going to have dominion over the angels. And the angels will minister to them. And Satan didn't like that idea. So he got booted out of heaven for that. And a, a one third of the angels followed him. You can read that in the book of Revelation. Right? <clears throat> so it says, in the woman, <clears throat> excuse me, in the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And it was pleasant to the eyes. In a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with him, her, and he did eat. See, just like we read in the book of James, when it said, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust like Eve did. Eve saw that tree. It was pleasant to the eyes, it was good for food, and it was desired to make her wise. So she partook, and she gave to her husband, because the serpent tricked her. Now, what, who, now we got two questions we got to answer. Who planted that tree, and what fruit was on this tree of good and evil? Well, let's go to, we got to go into an extra biblical book. We got to go into this book called the pseudo the pseudo pagrapha of the apocrypha and it's touched on the book of baruch 
Some might ask, who is Baruch? Baruch was a prophet during Jeremiah's time. Who left accounts? Who left records? When you understand the Bible and the story of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was telling the king, Jokonai, listen, man, we about to get taken down by the Babylonians. Submit to the Babylonians. This, to where if you just submit to the Babylonians be, and be in captive to them, this, you, you won't, the temple won't get burned. They won't come and take all our stuff. We'll just serve them. We'll be servants to them for 70 years. Either you're going to comply and go the easy route or you're going to fight and it's going to be bad for you. Jeremiah was talking to the kings of Judah at this time, trying to get them to understand the Most High God is furious of us. He's put in play that he's finna send us into captivity. He's finna send us into captivity because we wouldn't listen. So this led up to the, them doing all type of things to Jeremiah. And when Nebuchadnezzar finally appeared on the scene, he took Jokaniah, took all the made like the, the took all the people and brought some of them back to Babylon. And some people he left after he destroyed the temple of Jerusalem. Baruch was one of those men that was left back to make a count and make a record. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah to prove the validity of the book of Baruch that got the answer of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, who planted it, what it was, what fruit was it, what fruit did it bear in all this. To prove, I, I'm going, I gave you that backdrop to show you the validity of the book of Baruch. Now let's go into the Bible to prove this character existed. Let's go. The book of Baruch, uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 12. It says, and I gave the evidence of purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neariah, the son of Ma 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 Masiah, in the sight of Hanama, <clears throat> his uncle, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus say of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidence, this evidence of the purchase, both with which is sealed and this evidence which is open and put them in the earthen vessels that may continue many days. So this is the book of Baruch. These are the other books. He said, put them, I made this as evidence. Baruch carried those away because they wouldn't listen to the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He was trying to get Judas, Judah to turn or tell him, listen, we going into captivity. Do it the simple way. Don't let your pride get in the way and now Nebuchadnezzar come and take the whole, take us as slaves and then destroy the temple. He could have at least preserved the temple because we was going into slavery because we disobeyed God's commandments. The children of Israel did. The children of slaves. So, I said that to get to the point of who Baruch is. Now, let's go to the book of Baruch to prove that the, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the fruit that it bared, it was an actual fruit. What was it? And who planted that tree in the midst of the garden? This is the book, third book of Baruch, chapter four. Third book of Baruch, chapter four, dealing with the third heaven. It says this. And Baruch said, how does this happen? Let me skip down. It says this, I, and I said, I pray thee, because I'm going straight to it, and I pray thee, show me which is the tree which led Adam astray, like we read in Genesis, the third chapter. Baruch is asking the angel to show him what, what was that tree that led Adam astray, which led to people, to, to a new thing that was created in the earth, which was death, sin. He asking, what, let me see this tree, Right? He said, uh, and the angel said to me, it is the vine which the angel Samuel planted, whereat the Lord God was angry and he cursed him in his plant. While also on this account, he did not permit Adam to touch it. That's the first answer. So now we understand that that that's why he told Adam that tree that's in the midst of the garden. Don't you touch it. Don't you eat of it. Don't you because the day you do, you will die. Because he didn't plant that tree though. The angel Samael planted that tree. And the, some people might say, well, why God just didn't destroy the tree and just kill mankind? 
that goes to the moral and spiritual lesson of the interpretation. Many theologians emphasize the moral and spiritual lesson conveyed by the story. They suggest that the fruit represents the choice to disobey God's command, highlighting the consequences of human disobedience and the importance of free will. Because God gave us a free will choice to choose him. He don't want robots. If that was the case, why would he put his spirit in us? He wants to know if we're going to serve and follow and come and, and be obedient to him because we love him. Not because we're robots like they're creating with AI. So he gave man free will. But no, judgment coming. He gave everything a time stamp. Satan and his minions will be judged for their evil deeds. And the people who hearken and obey Satan and his diabolical minions will also have their fate sealed too. So we got a choice, brothers and sisters, right now. Just like we have choices throughout this world right now. With the, when the 2020 scare happened, a lot of people made some choices that they wish they could have took back. But you had free will nonetheless. Even though society was clamping down on your liberties, you still had the choice to say, I'm not getting inoculated. That's my right. I'm not going to do it. Even if it cost me my job, even if it cost me this, you still had a choice. But some people felt like they didn't have a choice because they too attached to the image of this beast, to this world system. So God always give us choices. But do you trust him? So that's the first answer. That it wasn't God that planted that tree in the midst of the garden. It wasn't God that planted that tree in the midst of the garden. It was the fallen angel, Samael, who planted that tree. Now, let's keep going, because then it said it was a vine. Hmm. Let's keep going, because let's keep reading, so we can understand what was on this vine. It says, the devil, being envious, deceived him through his vine. And I said, and I, Baruch, said, since also the vine has been a cause of such great evil, and is under judgment of the curse of God and was the destruction of the first created, how is it now so useful? Because that because that vine is what? Grapes. That's what it was, brothers and sisters. Muscadine wine, muscadine grapes. So one might say, well, can we eat grapes? Let's, let's prove. So now we understand that what was on this vine was grapes. Muscadine grapes or grapes, whatever you want to call them. And we know who planted that. Satan. Because when you make grapes and you smush them and you, you uh, preserve them and put them up, it can turn to wine. That's what wine is made out of. So check this out. Let's, let me keep reading to prove it. The book of Baruch proves it. Check this out. It says, so how is it useful? And the angel said, thou ask aright. right. When God caused the deluge upon earth and destroyed all flesh, and 409,000 giants, and the waters rose 15 cubits above the highest mountains. Then the water entered into paradise and destroyed every flower. But it removed wholly without the bounds the shoot of the vine and cast it outside. And when the earth appeared out of the water and Noah came out of the ark, he began to plant of the plants which he found. But he found, but he found also the shoot of the vine, and he took it and was reasoning in himself, "What then is it?" And I came and I spake to him the things concerning it, and he said, "Shall I plant it, or what shall I do?" So the angel came to him, and when no, after the flood, Noah found that vineyard, the grapevine. He was like, "What should he do?" That's why Noah, after he planted it for a while, he. He ended up drinking off that vine. And what happened? Noah got drunk. Pissy drunk. Butt naked. Ham came in there laughing at his dad. Butt naked. Passed out. And Shem and Japheth covered their father's nakedness. Because he had passed out. He was drunk. So that proving that this vine causes one to be alleviated. Check this out. It says, uh. And when the earth appeared out of the water, Noah came out, we read that, but he found also the shooter of the vine and took it. And he reasoned with himself, what then is it? And I came and I spake to him the things concerning it. 
And he said, shall I plant it or what shall I do? Since Adam was destroyed because of it, let me not also meet with the anger of God because of it. See? And, and saying these things, he prayed that God would reveal to him what he should do concerning it. And when he had completed the prayer, which lasted 40 days, and having besought many things and wept, and he said, Lord, I entreat thee to reveal to me what I shall do concerning this plant. But God sent his angel, sorry sell, and said to him, Arise, Noah, and plant the shoot of the vine. For thus say of the Lord, its bitterness shall be changed into sweetness. See, so now the most I changed the bitterness of that wine that was poisonous to sweetness. But check what he said. So he cleansed it. Right. And which we know is wine because you got bitter wine. You got sweet wine. Grapes make of wine. So now we understand the answer. But now I'm going into the reasoning behind it. Now, check this out. It says. Uh, he said, arise, Noah, plant the shoot of the vine for thus say of the Lord, it bitterness shall be changed into sweetness and its curse shall become a blessing. And that which is produced from it shall become the blood of God. Because remember what Christ said with the communion wine. So now you know the answer, brothers and sisters. It wasn't an apple. It was grapes. Who planted the tree? Samuel, fallen angel. God was angry. He told Adam not to touch of it. Adam didn't listen. It brought forth a deluge, a flood. Noah, after the flood receded and the waters came back down, Noah found he was planting all the flowers. And he found this vine. He found the grapevine. He debated on it. He prayed on it. He fasted on it. The angel told him, God said it's okay, plant it. Because he's going to turn it from bitter to sweet. To also, it's going to be commemoration of the blood of Christ. That's when Christ said, here, take the bread, for this is my body. Here, drink the wine, because this is my blood. And then Christ said, I won't drink another sip of this until I'm in the kingdom with y'all. So check this out. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. It says, its bitterness shall be changed into sweetness and its curse shall become a blessing. And that which is produced from it shall become the blood of God. And as, and as through it, the human race obtained condemnation. So again, through Jesus Christ at the Emmanuel, will they receive in him the upward calling and the entry into paradise. Now, therefore, O Baruch, that as Adam through this very tree obtained condemnation and was divested of the glory of God, so also the men who now drink insatiably the wine, which is begotten of it, transgress worse than Adam. See? That's your answer, brothers and sisters. But you have to go into extra biblical books to get the answer. Because why? The Roman Catholic Church under their Jesuits, theologians, and all these people, they hide the truth from us. They don't want us, they want us to understand the word of God through the lens of them. They don't want us to understand the word of God through the word of God. So now you have your answer, brothers and sisters. The examination of Genesis chapter 3. Who planted that tree that was in the midst of the garden? What was on that tree? And the reasoning. So, I hope that this lesson gave some edification just for the nuanced people that be asking, well, what was the tree? Was it the woman's vagina? Was it a sex organ? Was, was it an apple? Was it just a, a, a allegorical interpretation? Now you understand that it was actually literally a real fruit, which was the gra grapes. Now you understand the answer. But the key message of it all was the moral and spiritual lesson. And what was that? That now man has a choice to either disobey God's commands or listen to him with the choice of free will. So that's what the story represented in its totality. But for people that have nuanced questions and minuscule picks at little things that want to know every answer, the Bible got the answer for you. So with that, I conclude. Y'all stay blessed. If you like this live, share it. Like my page. We're going to add some more people in the time. I'm going to try to bring these out, bringing Bible Unlocked series. Till the next time, y'all be blessed.
Peace and blessings.